They're wily, they're witty, and they're enchantresses, and I'm going to make use of them in this Calyx Oathbreaker deck. Hello, Planeswalkers, and welcome to the Oath Breakdown, your place for Oathbreaker decks that I like to break down and build back up so you can see how they work. If you like what I do here on the channel, please remember to visit any of these fine retailers or to like, share, and subscribe to the video. Now let's get into it. Today we're going to be talking about Calyx, an Oathbreaker who used to just be an enchantment creature created by the gods of Theros. Calyx, Destiny's Hand, is two, a green and a white, for a four loyalty planeswalker. His plus one is to look at the top four cards of your library and you may reveal an enchantment from among them and put it into your hand and then put the rest back on the bottom of your library in any order. His minus three is to exile target creature or enchantment you don't control under an enchantment you do control until that enchantment leaves the battlefield. Is essentially turning any enchantment in our deck into an oblivion ring. His minus seven returns all enchantment cards from our graveyard to the battlefield. Our signature spell for this deck is Winds of Wrath. It is a board wipe that's going to destroy all creatures that aren't enchanted and they can't be regenerated. Since most of our creatures are going to be enchanted, this won't really hurt us as much as it's going to hurt all of our opponents. Now, our game plan with this deck is not just to build a small army of creatures that we can suit up with a lot of enchantments to make very dangerous very quick, but also to keep our opponents off of their game. So I'm going to go through those tactics real quick. So let's start off by talking about Paradise Druid for one in a green. It has Hexproof as long as it's untapped and we can tap it for one man of any color. And it's a 2-1. Now Hexproof is traditionally a that we would see in a deck like Boggles. We can turn our Paradise Druid into a makeshift boggle and i'll tell you how later on in the deck tech selesnia signet and selesnia locket they're going to help us fix for our colors karametra god of the harvest is a six seven creature that's indestructible she didn't really become a creature unless we hit her devotion but that's fine the main reason we love her is that whenever we cast a creature spell we may search our library for a forest or plains card and put it onto the battlefield tapped and then shuffle our library Poor Cartographer enters our battlefield. We can search our library for a planes and put it onto the battlefield tapped and then shuffle. Arescos Explorer, let us search our library for X planes cards, where X is the number of players who control more lands than us. We reveal those cards and put them into our hand and shuffle. Sanctum of Fruitful Harvest is the first of three shrines we are running in this deck. It reads, at the beginning of our pre-combat main phase, we can add X mana of any one color to our mana pool, where X is the number of shrines we control. Now, an important part of any deck we're building is going to be our value engine and draw mechanics, so let's get into that next. We're going to run Harmonize, because for 2 and 2 green, it's going to draw us 3 cards, which is a pretty decent rate for our colors. Selesnian Champion has Constellation, which means whenever an enchantment enters the battlefield under our control, we can put a 1-1 counter on it and draw a card, which is an excellent draw engine for us. For Spirit Dancer, it's going to get plus 2, plus 2 for each enchantment we attach to it, but also whenever we cast a creature enchantment, we get to draw a card. Mesa Entrantress is going to draw us a card anytime we cast any enchantment, including our enchantment creatures. Angelic Gift is going to give one of our creatures uh, evasion in the form of flying and let us draw a card, so it's going to combo well with our other things that let us draw a card when we play an enchantment. And finally, Season of Growth is going to let us scry the top of our deck and control the top of our deck anytime we play a creature, and it's going to let us draw a card anytime we target a creature we control. So if we cast any of our auras on our own creatures, this will work just like the Enchantresses will. Next, I want to talk about a small package of life gain abilities we're running that are going to help us stay into the late game. We're running Nyx Fleet Ram. It's going to give us one life at the beginning of each of our upkeeps. Honden of Cleansing Fire is going to give us two life for each shrine we control during each of our upkeeps. So this is the second of the three shrines I mentioned. On Sarah's Wings, we'll give one of our creatures Legendary, put, give it plus one, plus one, Flying, Vigilance, and Lifelink. The Lifelink's great here. The Flying is just Evasion we're asking for, 
And a keyword like vigilance is going to take our paradise druid and turn it into that makeshift bobble I mentioned earlier. So there's going to be some other effects that cause a similar type of imbalance in the game in our favor. Now one of the common problems you can run into when running an enchantress deck is having plenty of enchantments which will fill up your hand but not enough creatures to enchant. So what we're going to do is we're going to use a couple token generators. Love Struck Beast costs two and green. He's a 5-5, five, five. but if we use his adventure, we can also make a 1-1 one, one human creature token. Siona, Captain of the Pleiades. When she enters the battlefield, she lets us look at the top seven cards of our library, reveal an ore card among them, and put them into our hand. Then we put the rest on the bottom of our library in a random order. So now whenever an ore we control becomes attached to a creature we control, we also get to create a 1-1 one, one human soldier creature token. Arista of the Endless Web is 3-5 with reach, which will help defend our face and our planeswalker. But whenever an opponent casts an instant or sorcery spell, we're going to get a 1-2 spider creature token with we reach. Next, we have Felidar Retreat. Whenever land enters the battlefield under our control, we either get to create a 2-2 cat, or, better yet most of the time, we put a 1-1 counter on all of our creatures and they all gain vigilance. Next, we have Hondent of Life's Web. This is the last shrine in the deck. It says during our upkeep, we get to put a 1-1 colorless spirit creature token on the battlefield for each shrine we control. Now, I want to take a second here to talk about some cards that might give us additional unfair advantage in combat, which we're looking for. So we're running a Johnny the Great Hearted. He gives all the creatures we control vigilance, and he has five loyalty. If we plus one him, we gain three life. So he almost made the life package, but honestly, his minus two means way more to me. He lets us put a 1-1 counter on each creature we control and a loyalty counter on each other planeswalker we control, which can be good with the number of planeswalkers we're running. All that glitters is an enchantment that will give one of our creatures plus one plus one for each artifact or enchantment we control, which most of the time is going to be a lot. This can turn some creatures into veritable killing machines. An archetype of courage is going to give all of our creatures first strike, giving us a clear combat advantage while making it so none of our opponent's creatures can have or gain first strike, which is amazing. Now, when we're playing this deck, we are going to run into problems. Sometimes we will suit up one creature with a whole bunch of enchantments and abilities. And if we lose that creature, it can set us back. So let's look at some cards real quick that are going to protect us and our creatures. All Seed of Life's Bounty costs one. It's a 1-1 one, one with lifelink. If we pay one and sacrifice it, target creature enchantment we control gains protection from the color of our choice till end of turn. Stone Coil Serpent can come into play as big as we need it to. It has reach, which is good. Trample and protection from multicolor, so it kind of pre-protects itself. And it can be a good one of to get through certain board states or certain multicolored decks. Karametra's Blessing for one white is an instant. Creature we control is going to get plus two, plus two until end of turn, which makes a nice little combat trick. But as well as that, that creature is going to gain hexproof and indestructible till end of turn, making it incredibly hard for our opponents to remove. Destiny Spinner for one in a green is a 2-3. It says creatures and enchantment spells we control can't be countered. This is a great little piece of tech to protect us from the blue player at the table. It also has an ability where you can pay three in a green and target land we control becomes an XX elemental creature with trample and haste till end of turn where X is the number of enchantments we control. Sometimes this isn't a bad way to create a creature just as a big threat. And since this effect doesn't say anything about what speed it's played at, we can play that at instant speed to make huge blockers. The Wanderer is also a great piece of protection. It's going to prevent all non-combat damage that will be dealt to us and the other permanents we control. This is great because it means damage-based board wipes become ineffective as well as other burn spells. If we mine this to her, we can also use her to remove a creature with power 4 greater from the table. Finally in this section, we have Laid Line of Sanctity. It's in our opening hand, we get to play it for free. I never think that's going to happen, so I kind of don't worry about that. But it will give us Hexproof, making ourselves untargetable by the opponent's spells is going to help us sidestep a lot of problems at the table. Speaking of problems we might want to sidestep at the table, sometimes we just need to remove them and obstruct our opponents a little bit to help us get to victory. 
So we're running Reclamation Sage. When it enters the battlefield, we can destroy target artifact or enchantment. Eladon of Obstruction, which is going to make the loyalty abilities of Planeswalkers our opponent's control cost one colorless more to activate, which is way more than they'd have to spend otherwise. Sealed away for one in a white, we can play at flash speed. It's going to exile target tap creature and opponent controls until sealed away leaves the battlefield. Cage of Hands is another enchantment based removal spell. It's going to say the enchanted creature can attack or block. If we pay one in a white, we can return it to our hands. This is a wonderful ability because if our enchantresses are out, paying one in a white to return it to our hands and play it again is going to let us draw cards and get extra value on top of the fact that we can remove it from a less threatening creature and put it on a bigger problem when it enters play later. Vow of Duty isn't going to remove a creature from play, but it's going to make it so it can't attack us. It's going to give the enchanted creature a plus two plus two in Vigilance and it can't attack us or a Planeswalker we control. Vow of Wilderness does the same thing, but it gives the creature plus three plus three in Trample. Elspeth Conquers Death as a Saga. On the first lore counter, it's going to let us exile target permanent and opponent controls that is mana value three or greater. On two, non-creature spells our opponents cast that turn are going to cost two more to cast until our next turn. And on three, we get to return our creature or planeswalker from our graveyard to the battlefield with either an extra 1-1 counter on it or an extra loyalty counter on it, depending on what the card is. So that's all the cards in the deck. Real quick, let's go through the mana base. Blighted Woodland is a land that we can tap for colorless, or we can pay three and a green and tap and sacrifice it to search our library for two basic land cards and put them onto the battlefield tap. Bratchley's Pathway on one side is essentially a forest, and on the back side it's a plane, so we can play it on whatever we need to to help fix our mana. Command Tower will tap for one mana of either of our colors. Uh, Temple Garden does the same, and when it enters the battlefield, it is a shock land. We can pay two life to have it enter the battlefield untapped. Temple of Plenty enters the battlefield tap, taps for one man of each of our colors, but when it enters the battlefield, we can scry. And then we are running eight force and eight planes. Now this deck is a little outside of my usual budget, but it is $47.41 on TCG Player. So tell me what you think about this deck and how you might upgrade it. It might just help a brand new Oathbreaker who's trying to get into the game in the comments below. I want to thank you guys for stopping by and just remind you that your Planeswalker Spark lights up my life.